prosperity. And what did Pastor John MacArthur have to say about this? It's time for The Line of Fire with your host, biblical scholar and cultural commentator, Dr. Michael Brown. Your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. Call 866-34-TRUTH to get on The Line of Fire. And now, here's your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome, friends, to The Line of Fire as we continue to wade into controversy, but in a practical way that will infuse you with faith and truth and courage. That's why we're here to help you stand strong on the front lines. Here's the number to call. You can weigh in on today's conversation about the prosperity gospel versus biblical provision. You can weigh in on that or yesterday's conversation about slain in the spirit, whether it's of God or not. 866-348-7884. 866-348-7884. Two things before we dive in to today's topic. Number one, my brand new book, which releases in one month, May 7th, is now out. Well, it's not, I have a copy. I have an advanced copy. Turn the Tide, How to Ignite a Cultural Awakening. Practical, inspirational, what steps we need to take, cooperating with the Lord to see outpouring in the church become awakening in society, to see revival in the church become reformation in society. I believe this book will powerfully impact you as you read it. You can pre-order your signed numbered copy by going to our website, The Line of Fire. Dot org. You'll see it right on the homepage or banner. Click on that. It is a signed, numbered pre-order, so kind of a collector's item with the first printing. That's when we do it. You can do that right at our website. If you're not getting our frontline newsletter, boy, I can't wait to read a testimony to you, but I just heard it by word of mouth. One of my colleagues talking with an old pastor friend said the fire's back in his life. He's burning again. Why? Because the frontline newsletter. If you're not getting it, sign up right on our website, thelineoffire.org. Just click subscribe. Okay. Second thing has to do with yesterday's broadcast when we talked about slain in the spirit, whether it's God or not. And I use the principle of Jonathan Edwards, we ought not to limit God where he hath not limited himself. So if something is not explicitly spoken against in Scripture, if it doesn't violate Scripture principles— and if it bears good fruit to the glory of God's name, then you would say, well, that would seem to be the Holy Spirit at work. And of course, when you give, we have testimony after testimony after testimony, we shared a bunch yesterday, and I see them continue to pour in of people whose lives were changed when they encountered the Holy Spirit. Sometimes someone touched them, sometimes no one touched them, but they were overcome, they fell to the ground. And, and when they stood up, they were changed people. I just read another testimony. He said that he was prayed for by Steve Hill over 20 years ago. felt like a cannon exploded, but he didn't feel any pain. He said this put, God put fire in his heart for the Lord, and the fire is still there over 20 years later. That's the Lord who does that. And I haven't seen, I've tried, I, normally I, I don't have time to look at comments. I'm not able to, but I tried to look at a bunch responding to yesterday. I haven't seen a single one that was critical giving me an explanation for who did this. If it drew people closer to the Jesus of the Bible, turned them away from sin, gave them a hunger for the word, a hunger for the lost, a hunger to live a holy life, brought them to repentance. Who did that? That's the work of the Spirit, friends. That's the work of the Spirit. So when people challenge me, well, just because something's not written in the Bible is something we're supposed to do it. Well, we're called to lay hands on people, right, in different ways, be it laying hands on the sick or laying hands on ordination or or. Other aspects of laying on of hands is an important thing. Hebrews 6 singles it out as a foundational doctrine. So that's what we're doing. That's normative. Laying hands on people is normative. What the Spirit does is up to Him. And phenomenon of people being overcome by the Spirit is, is in the Bible and throughout church history. It's not something that just started happening in recent decades or 50 years ago or something like that. So we lay hands on people. That's what we do. God does the other part. So is it normative to lay hands on people? Yes. Then what the Spirit does, there are all kinds of things He does, and there are patterns in Scripture that we see continuing today. The other thing is people say, what about self-control? Well, self-control, as I've addressed in the past and written about, self-control in Greek and even self-evidently in context is moral self-control. It's not to say that Moses was lacking self-control when he was trembling in fear at Mount Sinai. It's not to say that Daniel was lacking in self-control when he collapsed like a dead man in the presence of Gabriel. In, in the book of Daniel. It's not to say that John was lacking self-control when he collapsed like a dead man at the feet of Jesus in the Revelation. That's not, that's not what self-control is about. Self-control is moral self-control, controlling our appetites, controlling the flesh, 
being disciplined. That's what it's talking about. In any case, why am I bringing up prosperity? Well, here's what I found really interesting. There is a carnal prosperity message that I have denounced for decades in writing and orally, and I have never once endorsed a prosperity message or endorsed a carnal prosperity preacher ever in my life. All right, go ahead and challenge me on it. You may say, well, you've said certain people you believe are saved. Yes, that's not endorsing someone. There are plenty of people that believe you're saved. I believe some of the worst critics on the planet coming against the gospel, that some of them, to my knowledge, are saved, even though they're doing tremendous damage coming against the things of the Spirit. All right, I'm not endorsing them. I'm not endorsing those I differ with us if I still believe they're saved, okay? So I've never endorsed the message. I've never endorsed a messenger for carnal prosperity message. But what I found interesting was among some of the, the critics, or they, you might call them hypercritics because of the extreme positions of the prosperity message, that they actually threw out biblical truth about sowing and reaping, about generosity, about provision, and that probably if you looked at their finances, they did very little to generously fund the gospel worldwide. Now, I've never looked at their finances. I'm just saying it would be logical because of the mindset. So for sure, I can tell you, that they threw out the baby with the bathwater. You know, I've, I've quoted Luke 6.38 to some about giving it shall be given you. He says, no, 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 it's not finances. In the context, it's not finances. Well, Pastor John, Mac John MacArthur would differ with that. So well, I got a call last Friday, and a gentleman was saying, I, I listened to a message from John MacArthur. From, from, uh, it's a two-part message on the path to prosperity. He said he sounded like a prosperity preacher. So I said, I'll see if I can get a staff member to listen to it. And he said, well, the transcript is there. So I started speed reading the transcript and, and I'm going to play clips for you today. And my point is not to say that John MacArthur preaches a kind of prosperity message. He denounces it just like I denounce it. But there, there is a message of sowing and reaping it. And here's the deal. You may hear somebody say, I am not going to preach carnal prosperity anymore. Then they turn around and they're preaching sowing and reaping. And you say, oh, they haven't they haven't changed. Well, if they did something manipulative and sinful and wrong and you give in order to get and, and, and you give for carnal reasons and now they're teaching, there are principles of sowing and reaping. Those are actually two different subjects. And that's what I want to lay out. What is biblical? What is right? And what is carnal and what is wrong? So first, I want you to hear what I have said about the carnal prosperity message in no uncertain terms. These are quotes from my 1990 book, How Saved Are We? I've never deviated from this. I've never moved from this, okay? You won't find it in writing. You won't find it in a message. This has always been where I stood. This goes back to 1990, before many of you listening were even born, from my book, How Saved Are We? This is the chapter called The Prosperity Trap. Here's what I wrote. Oh, yes, God can and will supply all our needs, and there's nothing shabby about his provision. He is not glorified through our poverty and lack. He gains nothing by us groveling in debt. He is a God of infinite wealth. He can afford to share it with us. All that we need is found in him. As we seek his kingdom first, it will all be provided for us. But to quote A.W. Tozer, God will not aid men in their selfish striving after personal gain. He will not help men to attain ends which, when attained, usurp the place he by every right should hold in their interest and affection. I continue, material wealth is never to be our goal. Paul could not have possibly warned us more clearly. People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. First Timothy 6, 9 and 10. Let us not read these verses lightly. Our very salvation could be at stake. Paul speaks of temptation and a trap of being plunged into ruin and destruction of all kinds of evil, of wandering from the faith. And so Paul exhorted Timothy in no uncertain terms, but you, man of God, flee from all this. Today we run after it and pursue righteousness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. For godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into the world and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 6 through 8. But are we really content? 
Or we like the Pharisees who loved money. It sneered at Jesus when he taught against greed. Luke 16, 14. The book of Proverbs says there are three things that are never satisfied. Four that never say enough. The grave, the barren woman, the barren womb, land, which is never satisfied with water, and fire, which never says enough. Proverbs 30, 15 and 16. Today, we can add one more. The materialistic American church. We are like the two daughters of the leech who cry, give, give. Proverbs 30, 15. We never have enough. This is all from my book, How Saved Are We, 1990. This is what has happened to our modern day prosperity gospel. It has run aground on the shallow shores of greed and ambition. It has capsized in the turbulent waters of selfishness. It has sunk under the weight of covetous hearts. May it never sail again. How could we be so blind? We have encouraged people to want to get rich. We have told them that it is all right to be eager for money. We have taught carnally minded believers who have not died to this world to pursue worldly wealth. And we try to make the whole thing so spiritual as if the reason God exists is to meet all our wants. Some even teach you can have whatever you say. So just speak it out all the time. A swimming pool, a giant screen TV, a mink stole. The Lord wants you to have an abundant life. And now many of us are trapped. We've taken our eyes off Jesus and put them on earthly treasures. The deceitfulness of wealth has tricked us again. It has stolen eternity from our hearts. Some of us have even become fools. We have stored up things for ourselves, but are not rich towards God. Luke 12, 20 to 21. 2,000 years ago, Jesus sounded an alarm. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Luke 12, 15. Yet today, we glorify greed and sanctify selfishness under the guise of great faith. We measure heavenly blessing by earthly bounty and equate real spirituality with financial success. Have we forgotten that God has chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? James 2.5. Do we realize that what is highly valued among men is detestable in God's sight? Luke 16.15. It is the man who lives for riches who will fade away even while he does, goes about his business. James 1.11. Let us cleanse our hearts now of all covetousness. James decrees his readers of being adulterous people, friends with the world. This is one of their symptoms. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. James 4.3. Yet our new teaching has fostered such praying. We have given it biblical support. Today, we really know how to use the word to get new cars and diamond rings. And we actually think all this is spiritual. God have mercy on us. Those are my words, friends, from 1990. It's never changed that position. We'll be right back. This is Michael Ellison, founder of Trivita Wellness. I want you to hear an amazing testimony from my friend, James Robison, and most all of you will know of him. He and his wife, Betty, host the Life Today television program. Now, here is James. Let me tell you about a miracle I experienced. My friend, Michael Ellison, he and his wife are our 40-year-plus best friends. Well, let me just say this to you. I had so much pain with what was called tennis elbow that I could hardly reach over and pick up the phone without pain, without it hurting me. I couldn't pick up something to drink, a glass of tea or anything. It was very difficult to do anything without wearing a tight strap. And then Michael shared the Nopal cactus juice with me, Nopalea. I began drinking about that much in the morning in a glass and that much later in the day. And in three months, I was a different person. I have now gone more than 10 years with no pain. Not better, well, I have no joint pain. I am telling you, it did something to the inflammation in my body that was undeniable. Now, that's just my testimony. But that's been more than 10 years with no pain. Matter of fact, if I miss for some foolish reason a few days, I can feel it creeping back that fast. So give it a try. See if it helps relieve your pain. I hope it does like it has mine because it worked for me. No Pelea is supported by clinical studies for lowering inflammation and improving mobility, flexibility, and range of emotion in the neck, back, and joints for less reliance on pain medication and improved quality of life. Call 800-771-5584 and use promo code BROWN25 to receive 25% off your order. As a new customer, 100% of your order goes to support the line of fire. Call 800-771-5584 
or go online to Trivita.com. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us. 866-34-TRUTH to get in the discussion of today's topic or yesterday's. And shout out to our friends at Trivita. Great products I use every single day. Give it a try. Uh, 100% of your first order goes to support the Line of Fire. 100%, literally. And there's a money-back guarantee as well. So call 800-771-5584. Or you can go to Trivita.com and use the code BROWN25. Okay. I, I had more in that chapter on the prosperity trap from How Saved Are We in 1990. I want to read a quote from my book, Playing With Holy Fire, a wake-up call to the Pentecostal Charismatic Church. This is 2018. And my message has never changed. You will not find a single sermon in any archive anywhere. You will not find a single article, a single book, a chapter in a book, a radio broadcast where I have ever deviated from this stand. Okay? Just to be clear. Which means I don't have to keep repeating it every six months. So, from Playing With Holy Fire, I said this. Do I believe in divine provision? Absolutely. Absolutely. Do I believe that God entrusts earthly riches to some of his people? Without a doubt. Do I believe that material blessings are sometimes a reflection of spiritual blessings? Certainly. Do I believe that the gospel can lift the poor from the garbage dump? Definitely. But I do not believe in the carnal prosperity message, one which takes our eyes off the cross, ignores the message of death to the flesh, and makes Jesus into the surefire path to financial success. And then verses I just read that I quoted in How Saved Rory from 1 Timothy 6, 7 through 11, I quote all those verses and then say this, what a different message is preached today, a carnal message, a worldly message, a message that brings lots of money to the big leaders who preach it and robs God's people along the way. It is a message that leads to bizarre scenes like the one I saw on YouTube where hundreds of believers run to the altar in a frenzy, throwing piles of money in the direction of the pastor standing in front of them while the crowd is shouting, money cometh to me. And they're doing this, all this because they believe as they give, their debts will be supernaturally canceled. They would do far better taking a course on godly financial stewardship. That's just an excerpt from a whole chapter on the pep talk prosperity gospel. So I've been absolutely clear on that, as has Pastor MacArthur. Let me read a quote to you from his 1996 message, The Path to Prosperity. This is part two. He said, we hear a lot today about prosperity gospel, about the fact that Jesus wants you rich, wants you to have a big house and a fancy car and an outlandish wardrobe and on and on and on. These greed-driven heresies are popular because they promise what virtually every false religion in the world has always been built around, and that is the idea that there is a God somewhere who gives us what we want. Virtually all false religions ever spawned by men and Satan, all false religion uh, worships a God whose function it is to deliver some cargo. And the point of that delivery is for self-indulgence, personal fun, personal pleasure, personal satisfaction. So it's not that we haven't heard a prosperity message. There has always been in false religion the message of prosperity, that the gods are there somehow. We need to plug into them so they deliver the goods to us. It's found its way into the aberrations of this health, wealth. Hang on, something's popped on my screen here. Health, wealth, prosperity, gospel in Christianity. But it's a far cry from God's true path to genuine prosperity. God is concerned about material material needs. God has promised to take care of that. There is a path to prosperity, but it is according to the word of God and not according to these concoctions of men. So he's saying there is a biblical prosperity message that's different than the carnal one. So with that, let's let's listen to some representative clips. 96, so he's already rejecting the carnal prosperity message, which was probably much more prominent and prevalent then in America. It is in other parts of the world now, but was probably more prevalent in different circles in America in the 80s and 90s than it may be today. Uh, And I'm sure many do hold to the error to this day. Many, many, but I think it's less pronounced now. In any case, this message is still on Pastor MacArthur's website. When I posted a quote from it and said, who said this? And I listed three well-known prosperity preachers and then Uh, And then uh, John MacArthur, people thought I was calling him a carnal prosperity preacher. No, my point was to say there there is a biblical message of provision. And when you're generous with God, he's generous with you. 
And Pastor MacArthur was emphasizing that. So people said, well, he doesn't hold to that anymore. It, it's still on his website. It's still on the Grace G website. And he was already refuting the counterfeit message back then anyway. So this is obviously a position he holds to. And it's biblical. It's biblical. So let's listen to clip number one. Now he seeks to motivate them by the potential benefit. Be motivated by example, be motivated by exhortation, and be motivated by the benefits that are bound up in your giving. If the example isn't enough and the exhortation isn't enough, maybe the benefit will be enough. This is the culminating way to reinforce his desire to motivate the Corinthians to give generously to the poor saints at Jerusalem and to motivate all of us to give as we should faithfully to the church and the work of God in the world. And again, I say he establishes the premise with an agricultural axiom that says the size of the harvest is in direct proportion to the amount of the seed sown. That's obvious. The farmer who sows only a small amount of seed is going to have a very small harvest. If he foolishly says, I I don't want to give away all my seed, I want to hold on to some of this seed, I'm afraid to, to give up all my seed, then his miserly approach to the sowing is going to result in a very small harvest. On the other hand, the one who sows bountifully is going to reap bountifully. When a wise farmer goes about sowing, he says, I want to find the biggest field, and in that, the biggest field that I can find, I want to put the most seed that I can get so that I can look for the greatest harvest possible. His generosity is tied to the benefit of that generosity. That's John MacArthur expositing verses that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. Some of those verses we're going to look at a little later in the broadcast. It's talking about sowing and reaping. It's a biblical principle. You want to write him off as a carnal prosperity preacher? Okay, we got time for clip number two before the break. Let's listen to this second clip. It is proper to translate it bountifully. It does have that idea, uh, sowing bountifully as opposed to sparingly. But it also carries the inherent idea of blessing. And it can have the sense that the man who sows with the view toward blessing is the one who is going to receive blessing. In other words, he who sows on the principle that he wants the most blessing possible is going to get the most blessing possible. (laughs) Okay. Friends, these are all in context. Go through the entire messages, the Path to Prosperity 1 and 2 on the website. These are all in context. You say, but that's different than saying, you need to give a certain amount to my ministry and your debts will get canceled. Yes, 100%. I agree. It's different. Pastor MacArthur agrees it's different. It's different than manipulating people to give, especially if it's going to be to your rich lifestyle. Okay? God's free to bless us how he wants to bless us. And those he blesses with more have more responsibility in their stewardship and in their generosity towards others. But the point is, there are principles of sowing and reaping that are found in the Bible. They, they are. In fact, I, I, I do have time for one more clip. So let's, let's play clip number three. We are not to do this giving from the heart grudgingly, that is, with grief or sorrow or reluctance or under compulsion. The first one has to do with inside attitude. The second one has to do with outside pressure. Because somebody told you you're supposed to give 10%, misunderstanding the tithe of the Old Testament. Or because somebody tells you there's a certain amount that you have to give, or because somebody is an authority in your life, or because somebody's in charge of you and they're putting this burden on you. Such an attitude is unacceptable. Even the Apostle Paul did not want to put a burden on people with regard to some legalistic giving. What he says is this, there's only one way to give, and that's to give cheerfully, for God loves a cheerful giver. And he quotes the Greek, from the hilarion from which we get hilarious. God loves a hilarious giver, a happy, joyful giver. God wants a heart that is thrilled with the pleasure of giving. That's the kind God loves. This is a very unusual statement. Again, I say God has a unique love for a generous person. Those are the words of Pastor John MacArthur echoing what Paul wrote and what many verses say in the Old Testament. There is no question many verses say as you're generous to God, and generous to those in needs, God is generous to you. That's not deniable. The question is, what's our motivation? What's in our heart? And and where do we put the things that God gives us? We'll be right back. Hey, 
Hey friends, Michael Brown here. My delight to serve as your voice for moral sanity and spiritual clarity. We are living in such urgent times today, friends, that all of us are in the line of fire. There's a target on your back. There's a target on my back. If you simply seek to live by biblical values or just conservative moral values, you could be canceled. You could be cast out. You could be put down. You could be silenced. I'm here to say, friends, that I am not about to be silenced, and I don't believe you are either. It is time for us to stand up. It is time for us to say enough is enough. It is time for us to push back in Jesus' name, not fighting the way the world fights. No, overcoming evil with good, overcoming hatred with love, overcoming the flesh with the power of the Spirit, overcoming lies with truth. And that's what we're here to do on the Line of Fire broadcast. And friends, it's not just a broadcast. It is a movement of people around the world, God's people standing up saying enough is enough and saying, Lord, here we are. Send us, use us. I want to urge you today to join our support team because we are on the front lines together. And we are literally touching people around the world, in America, in the nations, in Israel. And together with your help, we're going to amplify this voice and spread this movement around the globe. So I encourage you, go right now to thelineoffire.org, thelineoffire.org. Click Donate Monthly Support, thelineoffire.org. Click Donate Monthly Support. When you do, you become a torchbearer. We immediately send you two great life-changing books. We immediately give you access to many classes I've taught. Others have to pay to take those. You get them for free exclusive video audio content, a new audio message every month, an insider prayer newsletter, 15% discount on our online bookstore, so much more. Join our support team today. Go to thelineoffire.org. Donate monthly. This is how we rise up. It's The Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on The Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Thanks, friends, for joining us on the line of fire. Remember April 14th, not ashamed of Jesus day, just a special day for us to go out of our way to make others known, know that we are followers of Jesus. Hey, we love the Lord and we're here for you. How can we pray for you? How can we be a blessing in your life or just declare it to your coworkers through what you wear or bringing something with you conspicuous, identifying yourself with Jesus. Maybe you'll find out there are a whole bunch of other people in your job or in your school that are believers and you didn't know about them. Maybe that'll just push you a little more to not be so shy and kind of hiding things. And, hey, I, I love Jesus and I'm not ashamed of that. And I want to be a blessing in your life. Let, let's do it together. Go to notashamedofjesus.org. Notashamedofjesus.org to find out what you can do, different ideas, pastors, churches, there's still time to, plenty of time to announce this. Okay, uh, I'm going to play one more clip from John MacArthur. We'll skip over to number five because I read number four. And then here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the Word, and I'm going to look at what church leaders through history have taught about some of these passages. Sometimes we rightly react against a carnal what's-in-it-for-me message. We rightly react against a message that says Jesus died to make you rich financially. We rightly react against a message that judges your spirituality by your material goods. We rightly re reject a message that enriches others at your expense or manipulates others to get money to someone else for their benefit. We categorically reject that and renounce it and denounce it. At the same time, we don't want to swing the other way where we lose sight of principles of generosity because the positive side of a prosperity message, the positive side of a, of a message of generosity and of God's abundance has released hundreds of millions of dollars to the mission field and to help God's work around the world. That's, that's the positive truth. And by the way, for those that would trace a prosperity message back to Kenneth Hagin, he actually put out a book called The Midas Touch where he talked about, he, he brought leaders together in the Word of Faith camp and said, hey, I was preaching about provision. You guys have you guys have gone off the rails with this and gave a warning. Just for those that, that trace it back, you may agree or disagree with what he said, but just interesting to, to look at that. Okay, so uh, let's listen to one more clip, clip number five from John MacArthur. The question in your mind is about the power. 
If you give, will God return? The answer is bound up in His power. Paul says God is able. And His ability is so great, He is able to make all grace abound to you. God possesses all grace. All the grace there is in the infinity of God is available, and He gives it aboundingly. God doesn't hold anything back. God does not scrimp. The giving Christian does not lose. He cannot lose. He gains. And not just a minimal amount, but God returns your generosity with abounding grace. Now you say, wait a minute. What's he talking about here? What is this abounding grace going to give me? Well, it's going to give you provision, listen, so that you will always have all sufficiency for all things. You say, what does that mean? Material things. Life in this world. Life in this world. Listen carefully. The first essential meaning here, the primary essential meaning, the thing that Paul is talking about here, has respect to earthly wealth. Listen, because the harvest must have the same nature as the seed. You understand that? If you sow a certain seed, you get a certain harvest. The harvest has the same nature as the seed. If you sow wheat, you get wheat. You sow barley, you get barley. You sow oats, you get oats. Are you ready for this? You sow material things, you get material things. That's what it's saying. It's not talking about some spiritual graces. It's talking about money. When we sow money, we are graciously replenished by God so that we will always have all sufficiency for all things. God makes sure we don't have any needs. The giver will all ha always have plenty. You give it away, and you'll get the dividend back in kind. You sow your treasure with God, you sow your money, your possessions with God, and they'll lavish back to you. Actually... Pastor MacArthur even says it more strongly than I would. Uh, yeah, just having worked around the world with the poorest of the poor and seeing God does meet and God does provide and God does raise their standards as, as they, they know the Lord. Maybe they're not sleeping in the open air. Maybe they're sleeping under a grass hut and God's meeting them. And, and they can tell us a whole lot about faith and provision. But for all those of you that, that attack anyone who preaches laws of sowing and reaping, when it comes to giving, then attack Pastor MacArthur, okay? Or just say maybe we're overreacting. We are rightly rejecting the carnal prosperity message, but wrongly rejecting a message of biblical provision and God's generosity. Now, here's what Paul writes, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, beginning in verse 6. The point is this. He's talking about finances. He's talking about finances. He's encouraging giving to help the, the, the saints, the believers, poor believers in Jerusalem. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, quoting from Psalm 112, he has distributed freely. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. And then Paul writes this. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. I know people who are rich financially, and they have always been givers and God's blessed them materially and they give all the more. Thank God for that. And they help fund the gospel around the world. And it's scriptural. The sin is to put your trust in earthly treasures, to put your heart in earthly treasures, to, to look at godliness as a means of financial gain. That's the sin. That's the abuse. But the laws of sowing and reaping are biblical and found through the Bible and Pastor MacArthur here preaches it as strongly as any prosperity preacher I've heard. Yet again, renouncing and denouncing the error of carnal prosperity. So, uh, 
2 Corinthians 9, 6, that's the first verse I read. Listen to what John Chrysostom said. Still highly revered, especially in the Orthodox Church, 4th century. 2 Corinthians 9, 6. He said, accordingly, let us not simply have the recipient in view in showing generosity and almsgiving, but consider who it is who takes as his the kindnesses shown to the poor person and who promises recompense for favors done. And thus let us direct our attention to him while showing all zeal and making offerings with complete enthusiasm. And let us so generously in season so that we may also reap generously. Scripture says, remember, he who sows sparingly shall also reap sparingly. Let us consequently sow these good seeds generously so that in due season we may reap generously. Now, after all, is the time for sowing, which I beseech you not to ignore, so that on that day of harvesting we may gather the returns of what was sown here and be regaled with loving kindness from the Lord. Uh, Here's what Professor Gordon Fee said about this, one of the great New Testament scholars of the last generation, uh, and who wrote a book against the health and wealth gospel. Commenting on 2 Corinthians 9, 6, Gordon Fee says this, Having exhorted the Corinthians to free and liberal giving, verses 6 and 7, the apostle now allays their fears that such generosity will leave them impoverished. He references 2 Corinthians 8, 12 through 14. God is greater than either their needs or their fears. Paul's word order is telling, Abel is God. God's power is seen not merely in providing, as the provision as if the provision narrowly met the need. Rather, God is powerful to make his grace overflow toward the Corinthians so that they will have ample sufficiency. But even this, as good as it may be for the giver, is not an end in itself. Rather, that having sufficient, you may overflow in every good work. Here's what he says. Uh, In fact, I'll read read John Calvin to you on 2 Corinthians uh, 9.8. Or hang on. I think Calvin is next. I believe this, you know, is this, is this Calvin or is this free? I have it as Calvin. All right, let's read it. Second Corinthians 9, 8. Now for Paul's similitude, he that sows sparingly will have a poor harvest corresponding to the sowing. He that sows bountifully and with a full hand will reap a correspondingly bountiful harvest. This is John Calvin. Let this doctrine be deeply rooted in your minds that whatever, whenever carnal reason keeps us back from doing good through fear of loss, we may immediately defend ourselves with the shield But the Lord declares that we are sowing. The harvest, however, should be explained as referring to the spiritual recompense of eternal life, as well as to earthly blessings, which God confers upon the beneficent. For God requites, not only in heaven, but also in this world, the the beneficence of believers. Hence, it is as though he had said, the more beneficent, beneficent, I keep getting this wrong, you are to your neighbors, you will find the blessing of God so much more abundantly poured out upon you. He again here contrasts blessing with sparing, as he had previously done with niggardliness. Hence, it appears that it's taken to mean a large and bountiful liberality. Then 2 Corinthians 9, 8, John Calvin, that having all sufficiency in all things, he mentions the twofold advantage arising, arising from that grace, which he had promised to the Corinthians, that they should have what is enough for themselves and would have something over and above for doing good. By the term sufficiency, he points out the measure which the Lord knows to be useful for us, for it is not always profitable for us to be filled to satiety. The Lord therefore ministers to us according to the measure of our advantage, sometimes more, sometimes less, but in such a way that we are satisfied, which is much more than if one had the whole world to luxuriate upon. In this sufficiency, we must abound, for the purpose of doing good to others. For the reason why God does us good is not that everyone may keep to himself what he has received, but that may be a mutual participation among us according as necessity may require. So you give generously, God gives back to you. Now you have what you need, you can give to others. And then Matthew Henry, a bridge commentary, 2 Corinthians 9, 11. Here the apostle tells the Corinthians, they themselves would be no losers by what they gave in charity. This may serve to obviate a secret of, well, tell you what, finish on the other side of the break. No 
Tropilea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. I really enjoy being physical. It's something I've just always loved, but I've definitely had times where it's really crippled me up. Being a horse trainer can be pretty physically demanding with all the duties that I have, not just riding horses for a living, saddling horses, caring for the horses. I feel like no playa just took the edge off and then it's it's continued to keep me from getting sore. No playa, it's been a huge blessing. Now there's a solution by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. Nopalea, made from the superfruit of the Nepal cactus, containing a unique group of bioflavonoids clinically shown to reduce chronic inflammation. In a random double-blind placebo-controlled study, it showed a reduction of elevated at-risk C-reactive protein levels, resulting in an improvement in range of motion in the back, neck, and joints and an overall improvement in the quality of life. It's fun to be on the golf course again. I'm able to swing the club freely. Hopefully I'm hitting better golf shots. No play has allowed me to get back on the golf course, enjoy the game that I love, and maybe even give me that little edge to beat my friends at the game. No Pelea has helped thousands of people by lowering levels of chronic inflammation. To place your order, call 800-771-5584 or online at Trivita.com. As a new customer introductory offer, use promo code BROWN25 for a 25% discount on your purchase of Nopalea. And 100% of your first order will go to the support of Line of Fire. Go to Trivita.com or call 800-771-5584. Again, 800-771-5584. It's the Line of Fire with your host, Dr. Michael Brown. Get on the Line of Fire by calling 866-34-TRUTH. Here again is Dr. Michael Brown. Welcome back to the Line of Fire. Remember, if you're not getting our infra- inspirational, informational, impartational frontline newsletter, sign up at thelineoffire.org. Right on the homepage, hit subscribe. And if you want to pre-order a signed numbered copy of Turn the Tide, How to Ignite a Cultural Awakening. It'll be out May 7th. Can't wait to get this in your hand. I really believe it's going to make an impact on many. You can do that also right on the homepage, thelineoffire.org. And for those who always think the worst, just another reminder, every book we have ever sold through our ministry, be it on radio, on TV, in person, every single one, every single dollar has gone to the ministry, and none of it has gone to me. Just to mention that for those who wonder. Okay, I want you to get the book. It's going to impact your life. That's why I write the books. So if you missed the beginning of the broadcast, in categorical terms, I denounced the carnal prosperity message as I have consistently without fail, never deviating from that for decades. So in my book, How Saved Are We? 1990, in my book, Playing With Holy Fire, 2018, reiterated that Also read a quote from Pastor MacArthur saying similar things. My words may have even been stronger uh, than his, but both denouncing that. But I've been playing clips from Pastor MacArthur and reading quotes from Scripture, then from church leaders through history who are affirming God's generosity. And Pastor MacArthur very clearly saying, if you sow a financial seed to give and to bless, God will, will reward you with a financial blessing. The seed will be in kind. So... Here's what Matthew Henry says, a bridge commentary, 2 Corinthians 9, 11. He's commenting on this. Here the apostle tells the Corinthians, they themselves would be no losers by what they gave in charity. This may serve to obviate a secret objection in the minds of many against this good work who are ready to think they may want what they give away. In other words, I'm going to give, but now I'm not going to have. I'm going to give to help the poor. I'm going to give to help the gospel go to this unreached people, but... I'm not going to have. I gave sacrificially. And, and he says, such should consider that what is given to the poor in a right manner is far from being lost as the precious seed, which is cast into the ground is not lost, though it is buried there for a time, it will spring up and bear fruit. The sower shall receive it again with increase. Such good returns may those who expect to give freely and liberty and charity. So Matthew Henry is saying, hey, you give freely. You help the poor. You help those in need. You supply the gospel. And, and God will, will, will cover you. God will pay you back. You'll, you'll, you'll reap generously as you've sown generously. Gordon Fee, 
to Philippians 4.19, where Paul, writing from prison and helped by the offerings, this is sometimes the only way you could survive in prison is that people brought you food and cared for you or helped others with offerings and he's showing his appreciation and saying, my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory in Messiah Jesus. Here's what Gordon Fee says. The mention of God at the end of the preceding sentence leads directly to this final wrap-up of his rejoicing in the Lord over their gift, which serves as evidence both of their care for him, verse 10, and their long-standing friendship with him, verses 15 and 16. Friendship presupposes reciprocity, mutual giving and receiving. This sentence is a master stroke, although we cannot reciprocate in kind since their gift had the effect of being a sweet-smelling sacrifice pleasing to God. Paul assures them that God, whom he deliberately designates as my God, will assume responsibility for reciprocity. Thus, picking up the language, my need, from verse 16, and fill to the full from verse 18, he promises them that my God will fill up every need of yours. He says they obviously have the better of it. First, he promises that God's reciprocation will cover every need of yours, especially their material needs, as the context demands, but also every other kind of need as the language demands. One cannot imagine a more fitting way for this letter to conclude in terms of Paul's final word to them personally in the midst of their poverty, 2 Corinthians 8, 2. God will richly supply their material needs and their present suffering in the face of opposition, Philippians 1, 27 to 30. God will richly supply what is needed, steadfastness, joy, encouragement, and their need to advance in the faith with one mindset. God will richly supply the grace and humility necessary for it. So everything needed from finances to character. And then Psalm 112, verse 3, where the, it says of the, the righteous, godly one who gives, wealth and riches shall be in his house. Charles Spurgeon says this, understood literally, this is rather a promise of the old covenant than of the new. For many of the best of the people of God are very poor. Yet it has been found true that uprightness is the road to success and all other things being equal, the honest man is the rising man. Many are kept poor through knavery and profligacy, but godliness hath the promise of the life that now is. And he doesn't quote the other part, as well as the life of the world to come. If we understand the passage spiritually, it's abundantly true. What's interesting, though, is that Paul quotes from Psalm 112 about the generous man and 2 Corinthians 9. In other words, many would say, just go back to verse after verse in the book of Proverbs that hard work and generosity produce financial abundance. Now what you're supposed to do with it is give and share of that abundance. The problem is we preach a message that makes financial abundance the goal. That's the carnal prosperity message. We preach a message that judges spiritual, uh, spiritual standing, spiritual blessing, spiritual maturity by outward possessions. Uh, one of my colleagues many years ago, no, actually was as a guest speaker, guest speaker, at ministry school, um, remembering where it was in, in 1980s on Long Island. He was a world missions leader. And he was saying that he was at a recent conference and there were a lot of these big shot wealthy preachers there. And there was a, a brother that had been in China, communist China, persecuted for his faith, was in prison, was tortured, and was dressed, you know, pretty lousy outfit. And one of the guys went up to him and rebuked him for his lack of faith. <laughs> Oh, yeah. The rich American preacher who got rich off the offerings of, of the people he manipulated. He's rebuking the guy who's been tortured for his faith and didn't deny Jesus. Yeah, that's that's what's vulgar and ugly and destructive. Or, you, you know, you put a picture of of the, the Porsche that you want, you're believing for or the Lamborghini and you're going to speak it into existence. That, that's the carnal junk that we reject. But we don't reject the message of sowing and reaping. We don't reject biblical principles. That is, you give generously with a joyful heart to, to God. He responds generously. And it's not just that he meets your need. So you felt the Lord laid on your heart to give $1,000 to this work in India, and you gave it, and you, you sat with your spouse, said, all right, it's a stretch to do it. We're going to trust God. Well, at the end of the month, all our bills were paid. But God wants to give you more so you can have more to give and bless others. Right? And it, And... At the same time, some of the godliest people in the world are poor and suffering, just like in the Old Testament. That was also true in the Old Testament. 
even with the promises of blessing that God gave to Israel. You read Hebrews 11 and talks about some of the people of faith. They lived in caves. They, they went around naked. They, they had nothing. And yet they were people of faith. And as I quoted earlier, Jacob, James 2, hasn't God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, to be heirs of the kingdom? As I've, as I've stood on street corners at different times and shared the gospel, or go, you go in the neighborhood sharing the gospel, you generally find much more openness among the poor than among the rich. It just very commonly you find that for obvious reasons. One recognizes their need and the other gets caught up with earthly things. But, but let us not deny or downplay the wonderful promises of God. I, I have zero question as you give to, to, to meet the needs of the poor, as you give to extend the gospel and to solid ministry works, that, that God will bless you. Uh, the greatest blessing is treasure in heaven. Yes. And, and then his work in your own heart and life. But as you give sacrificially and obedience to him, he'll, he'll meet your needs and he'll allow you to give more and be a blessing. It's good. All right. Uh, two more quotes from John MacArthur while we have time. Let's play clip number six from Pastor MacArthur's twofold message or two-part message on the path to prosperity. Now follow very carefully. This is crucial. God's going to pour this back to you in kind. You've sowed your treasure. You've sowed your money. You've sowed your possessions. He's going to give it back to you. Here's why. So that you may have an abundance for every good deed. Oh, here is the great truth here. Don't miss this or you miss the whole point. The reason God gives it back to you with such overflowing generosity is so you can use it to do more good deeds. That's the thing. It's not to consume it on your own desire. Yep, exactly. That's the point. All right, last clip from Pastor MacArthur. Again, I'm playing these in agreement, not to be critical, but to say amen. Let's not throw this out. When we, while we reject and denounce the carnal prosperity message. Last clip from Pastor MacArthur. So God gives back what you sow. He gives it back, pressed down, shaken together, running over. He gives you back more so that you can do every good deed, so that you can sow more seed, so that you can give with more generosity. The point is very simple. God blesses our giving so that we can give more it's not that we can buy more for ourselves. It's not so that we can consume it on ourselves, so that we can elevate our lifestyle to an outrageous level. God gives to us so that we can continue that which gained that gift, and that is our generosity. Yeah, amen. That's what's written in Scripture. Amen to that. I want to encourage you in your local churches, be generous. I want to encourage you when you stand behind gospel ministries doing really good works. Be generous. I want to thank all of you that generously support our ministry. The whole reason we do what we do is to reach more people and have a greater impact. I want to thank all of you who've been faithful in whatever place God's put you with the finances he's given you, whether large or small. I want to thank you for your faithfulness and your generosity to the work of God and to the kingdom of God. We've got a great interview with Dr. Mark Stengler coming your way tomorrow.